Good evening, everybody. It's great pleasure to see you all here uh, attending our webinar. First of all, uh, my name is Konstantin Kostura. I am a prostodontist. Uh, I've been practicing in Kyiv, in Ukraine, in a big dental clinic. Uh, and actually, today, my practice is limited to restorative dentistry. Personally, I don't place implants, but I, have, but I do a lot, really a lot of prosthetics over the implants. Uh, and actually, that's the reason uh, why I was suggested to talk about uh, the type of retention of the implant prosthetics. Uh, today, we are going to discuss uh, which type the cement or screw retained uh, from the point of contemporary dentistry is uh, more reliable, is more predictable, and what actually contemporary literature says about that. And, uh, how in reality in our everyday practice should we choose whether one type of treatment or other will be the better for our patients. So every single lecture uh, that I make begins from this slide. And uh, the reason is very, very simple. My idea is to remind you that uh, we work with living persons. Uh, as a dentist, as a doctor, we tend to um, imagine our patients as machines. We sometimes forget how uh, complex this system is. And uh, we should remember that we work with living patient uh, and some, there are some laws uh, in our organism. And actually these laws are physiology. And this physiology is really strict. We should follow that uh, to do our best for our patients. And for today, the Implant-supported reconstructions are a well-established option treatment for our patients. And uh, in our clinic, uh, they have evolved to a standard of care for our patients. We actually do more, for year and year, uh, we do more and more uh, implant crowns, single implant crowns, and the bridge prosthetics uh, have been less and less popular. Uh, as we tend to do the best for our patients. And as the implant therapy evolves uh, and becomes the standard of care, uh, the population seeks uh, the alternatives to a conventional uh, fixed puncture dentures uh, and uh, complete dentures uh, for the treatment of edential areas in the aesthetic zone or in the posterior region. Uh, the success will be dependent upon uh, more than simply an also integration. Historically, uh, uh, historically, the actual uh, modern dentistry, implant dentistry, begins from the middle of the last century when uh, professors Paringer, Brandmark, and Andrew Schroeder uh, suggested uh, the osseointegration concept. That is the point zero for us. And since uh, the middle of the 60s uh, till uh, 80s, the Brunemark uh, implant system uh, was the most popular and actually the restorations uh, were attached to implants and implant abutments with screws. So the implant mechanics were challenging. They were, they were very complex. It was uh, hard for dentists to understand how do that works, uh, especially because there were not really a lot of programs where, where people studied about it. Uh, and in the late 80s, uh, the ITI implants, uh, they did a revolution in a restorative dentistry, in an implant restorative dentistry. Uh, this system changed uh, the whole, whole uh, dentistry for many, many years, actually by just simply modifying abutments uh, so they could be uh, treated like a tooth uh, and actually prepared like a crown, like a simple crown. Uh, and that uh, made it a lot easier for the dentists that have been uh, years and years uh, taught how to cement the crowns. And uh, actually, um, before that, uh, implants were used, uh, originally they were used for fully, completely edentulous patients. Uh, the whole idea of Professor Ingrid Brunemark was uh, to not to use complete dentures at all. He uh, suggested that that's a worse way to treat, to treat people. Uh, so the uh, 
ITI implants allowed us to uh, make very small regions, uh, make single implant crowns, uh, small fixed partial dentures. Uh, and actually the system allowed for snap-on impression cuppings and uh, for final illustration simply to be cemented in place. Uh, soon uh, that was followed by zero one system uh, and implant restorative dentistry slowly became routinized. Cemented restorations re replaced screw retained restorations as the method of choice for final restorations. And that was uh, the way how plenty of patients were treated. Uh, lot, some, some dentists were still doing screw retained restorations, but uh, more and more. Uh, there were the cementable options were more and more popular as they were a lot easier. And uh, we will talk more about that later. And, and in 2009, Wilson described uh, the routine cement in pre-implant mucositis and pre-implantitis. Uh, he actually found that uh, a long time after uh, the crowns were cemented, uh, they can the cement, the cement remnants are still present uh, in a lot of implant cases. Uh, and he found that uh, even after nine years, uh, post-cementation, it can cause some problems. And actually, uh, the 2000s and uh, contemporary uh, implant dentistry has been focusing on the problem of pre-implantitis. And the most common reason for the pre-implantitis is uh, the cement. And actually, we see that historically, uh, studies of implant biomechanics uh, have been focused on the screw retained restorations as they are more complex. Uh, and nevertheless, the cement retained designs uh, have achieved broad use despite the limited scientific evaluation. So, the reason why people started to use cement retained designs were simply uh, the simplification of procedure. Everybody tried to do uh, the less the least constructive paths. And uh, for today, Professor Daniel Boozer says it's direct citation. Since the days of the founding fathers, the choice between predominantly screw retained or cement retained prosthetic restoration has been a matter of debate. So as 20 years ago, so and today, uh, there are very, very, very a lot of discussion about whether screw retained or cement retained are the best, uh, what to use, what do we have, complications. And actually, contemporary literature is full of information about that. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of systematic reviews on uh, whether it is good or it is bad. And actually, we see that they are pretty much the same. Independently, they were done 15 years ago or they are very, very fresh and from the last year. So, first of all, uh, are there really a difference between the screw retained prosthetics and the cement retained? Actually, uh, that is the one question, the only one question that usually patients do not talk about. Uh, I've had only one patient that uh, asked me to do only screw retained restoration. The reason for that was she had a lot of implants with uh, external hexagon done years, years before, and she had terrible headache about uh, this, uh, about the screw, about the rotation of screw uh, when it just fell away. And uh, every time she had this problem, uh, she was needed to redo her prosthetics. So her main concern was it to be repeatable. But generally, patients do not think about that and they do not ask you to do whether this or other type of treatment uh, which we can say about the other possibilities they often choose uh, ceramic or metal ceramic uh, types of restoration they choose material they choose type of what they want they choose even the quantity and sometimes some patients even ask for certain implants to be placed depending on their experience or the information they read about uh, on the internet there are really plenty, plenty, plenty of ways they uh, know about it. So the screw retained uh, restorations. First of all, uh, predictable retrievability. Uh, it's very easy in case of some uh, problems, some events undergoing uh, to unscrew the crown, check everything and screw it back. Actually, it's one of the main 
uh, reasons why 100% of uh, temp restorations in our dental practice are screw retained. And to say it truly, it's much easier, we feel uh, less headache when we do, when we perform a screw retained reconstructions. Uh, and I will show you actually later why. Uh, second part is that it requires a minimal amount of intraclusal space, as minimal as four millimeters. We have a lot of uh, patients where, where patients with wrong dentition. The reason, I guess, is the whole um, stress which they which they have in their daily life, uh, and the reason why we don't use. Uh, cement retained crowns in such situations is very simple. Um, they have often uh, cementation problems. The less intracusal space we have, uh, the less retentive forces uh, are applied to that. And actually the screw retention uh, completely uh, ruins this problem. Next thing, they're easy to remove for hygiene maintenance, repairs, and surgical interventions. Unfortunately, uh, we do have periodontal patients, they have pre-implant disease, mucositis, and sometimes we need to do additive surgery, sometimes we need to perform some kind of repairs, and uh, scrutiny restrictions makes, makes this uh, a lot easier. It decreases the stress of our patients, our stress, uh, and especially for the patients uh, with complete dentures uh, over the implants, the hygiene maintenance for them are a lot, lot, lot easier. The reasons why screw retained constructions are not that good. First of all, it's, it requires prosthetically driven implant placement. Every single uh, implantologist will tell you that it's much harder to find the place to place an implant uh, for the screw retention hole to have the right access. And actually, that's the reason why a lot of uh, implants, contemporary in, in Ukraine, I'm uh, talking about the Ukrainian statistics, in the frontal region are made cement retained. It's often, uh, there are often not that much tissues, hard tissues to place the implant in a correct position. So, it usually takes a lot of effort from surgeon, from the implantologist, and from the prosthodontist to see uh, how should it be done for us to make the screw retained crown. The second part uh, is that manufacturing process is more technically sensitive and more demanding compared, compared to cement retained crowns. Uh, it has become a lot easier since we have a lot of uh, cut cam designs cut come options, but still uh, a lot of dental technicians don't love to do screw retained crowns, especially over uh, the implants with conical connection. The reason is quite simple. Uh, with conical connection, uh, when we screw the implant harder, uh, the level of the occlusal plane goes down. So sometimes we've met that problem 10, 15 years ago when we started to use the conical connection in our dental practice. We've noticed that some uh, crowns were, infra, were, were positioned infra-occlusally. Uh, they do not reach the antagonists. And actually, it's a lot easier to check up. It's a lot easier to do. And that's uh, also digitally more, more uh, understandable for us how to make cement retained crowns. What about cement retained? They are not as technically demanding as the screw retained. It's, uh, we've, been started, we've been taught that in dental schools and universities how to cement crown, how to prepare abutments, what to do, what kind of cement to use, how to check up the feet. Uh, they are also very easily to make a passive feet restorations, especially when we are doing fixed partial dentures on implants. Uh, we know for today that that's hard to perform with conical connection. Once again, that's a lot. Uh, that's a big question for our implantologists: how to place implants parallel to make the passivity of fit. And actually, with cement retained crowns, it's not a problem at all. We just choose the standard abutments. What do we need? Or we make uh, the individual abutments, and we simply cement crowns on them. It's a lot, a lot, a lot easier. Second part: they are less cost-intensive to procedure. 
uh, to produce. Actually, that was right uh, in 2000, 2005. For today, uh, for example, in Ukraine, it costs almost the same for us to do the screw tint or the cement retaining things, to uh, cut gun designs, to things to intraoral, extraoral scanners. Everything becomes uh, much easier day by day. The second, uh, the third thing I want to show you is actually the possibility of implant position discrepancies compensation. Uh, often implants are placed uh, where the bone is. It actually, that was called uh, the implantology, uh, the surgically driven implantology, when surgeon just places the implant where he is able to. And often in such situations, uh, the screw accessing hole uh, is on the vestibular or on the palatal side, where on the posterior teeth, for example, uh, where it shouldn't be due to the aesthetic reasons. So in such cases, we have only one option to make cement retained crown. Uh, the fifth point is profit aesthetics. Uh, it's discussable. Actually, with Urban uh, says that, but it's discussable. It's a lot easier to make uh, a single anterior crown with cementable on an implant, uh, just due to the reason we can a uh, few times try in it, we can check the color, we can change it uh, if we want, and in the way if we just we glued uh, to the titanium base, it's a lot harder. And it's a lot easier to control occlusion, especially with conical connections, especially in patients with uh, some occlusal disease. The main reasons why we don't use uh, the cement, why we try not to do the cement retained crowns, uh, there are difficulty of removing excess cement. I will show the Linkevich's uh, findings. Uh, to say briefly, we are not able to remove completely cement in any way, independently of how experienced we are. Uh, they are much more biological. Uh, there, there are much more biological complications uh, in the cement retained groups and actually a whole plenty of uh, systematic reviews uh, we've been watching, uh, they all say the same. Uh, the pre-implant diseases have a strong accordance to the cement remnants. And the last one, they are harder to retrieve. In terms of any kind of complication, uh, do we have uh, this, do, we, do we have the screw loosened or we have some kind of achievements? Uh, we need to cut off the whole reconstruction. And often that's the only way to do that. Uh, so when we're talking about complications, the total even trade is always higher with cemented reconstructions. Uh, what does that mean? That uh, there are more problems, we face them more often with cemented reconstructions. Uh, if we're talking about fractures and chippings of ceramics, they are really high with screw retained reconstructions. Why? Because we have a screw retention hole and uh, especially with narrow crowns, for example, premolars, uh, there are less reinforcement for the ceramic. And so we have the chips. On the left photo, you see uh, it's the lower second molar. Uh, distally, after two years of function, we have achievement, and actually, uh, as for me, I don't see the problem. Uh, we just have some compensation from our uh, clusal sensory system. The losing of abutment is really a lot higher with cement retained growth, and that's actually a biggest problem. Uh, when the screw is loosened, when the abutment is loosened, we need to somehow to screw it down to make it, uh, to fix that in place once again. And as you see on the right photo, uh, often we need just to cut the crown as uh, far as there are no other options. We do not have direct, direct access to the implant. And often that ends up in changing the whole restoration. So, uh, direct station. The total even trade for biological complications was significantly higher with cemented compared to screw retained reconstructions. Presence of fistula separation appears statistically significantly more often with the cemented reconstructions. And uh, actually we've seen that a lot. Uh, some patients 
came to us from our dental clinics and we see the slides like uh, on the third and on the third when we where we have fistulas we make uh, tracing Rengen, uh, we make tracing x-ray and we notice that uh, it goes just directly to the implant. So let me show you the clinical case with cemented crown. On the first side, we see the patient with temporary screw retained crown, and we see that excess hole is uh, just on the middle of incisal edge. Uh, our dent, our implantologist tried her best to make it more palatal, but unfortunately, uh, we have what, what do we have? And in case if we will do the screw retained crown, it will be disaster for the patient. So. What do we see next? We see the emergence profile we have modified, and we actually see uh, the custom zirconia abutment on the place. After we uh, tighten the screw, uh, we tighten that with 35 newtons with dynamometric range. Uh, we simply, like with initial teeth, we can cement the crown. And uh, the main thing we need to match uh, and thank God we have a microscope in our daily practice, uh, the precision of abutment crown interface. It's uh, the, main, the main thing we should notice, the main thing we should have. And on this slide you see it's pretty much perfect. We don't see the finish line. That might be, sorry, uh, that might be a little hard for our dental technicians, but uh, if everything is done properly, that's the picture what we should see when we uh, try in our crown with definitive abutment. So on the next slide, we see the final crown cemented. And uh, I was a little bit uh, disappointed because uh, we chose the wrong chroma. Actually, I was ready to redo this crown when we were trying it in, but somehow the patient liked how it looked like. I don't know why, but she was pretty happy with this hyperchromatic uh, layer on the cervical part. And the second thing I see is uh, we have overcompressed the distal papilla. Uh, that's the one thing uh, we have not mentioned while we were cementing. And I've seen this patient two years after. What do we see on this picture? We see the swelling gingiva. Uh, actually, the main thing we do correctly, as you see on this slide, we placed uh, the margin, the shoulder, uh, equigingivally. So that was really easier to remove cement. I will also show you at the end few techniques how uh, to make it more predictable, and we use them. So I was not afraid that we will see cement, especially because this is a uh, frontal central incisor, and that was really easily to clean that everything out, especially because we have the equigingival margin. But still, she has inflammation, uh, and this inflammation she has only after weeks, uh, only eight weeks after professional hygiene. Uh, and I've made the photo for her. Oh, oh actually we made an X-ray, and on X-ray everything is perfect. We don't see the cement remnants. We don't see any problems, any complications. The marginal bone loss is uh, almost zero for this case, which seems to be perfect for us. But still, see, she has inflammation. The reason of this inflammation is actually her personal hygiene. And bad hygiene destroys implants in any way, independently was that the screw retained, whether that, whether that is a screw retained or a cement retained, doesn't matter. Bad hygiene destroys implants once again. I've done this photo, I always do such photos for our patients when they have some problems with hygiene. I show them and ask a simple question. Does that look naturally to you? Does that look healthy to you? She was very disappointed, uh, she think she thought that that's just how her gingiva should look like. Uh, but since then, uh, we see small improvements in her hygiene. Without her hygiene, everything will be simply destroyed. Everything will be lost. So moving forward, the retrievability. As I've already mentioned, 
uh, in cases with screw retained crowns on the left. It's easy, easy to change anything we want. If we have chipping, we can unscrew the crown, uh, correct it, and screw it back. If we have, uh, if we think that profile is not ideal, we can unscrew that, correct, and screw it back. If we have some problems with uh, gingiva and we need uh, to make a surgical intervention there, it's a lot easier for a surgeon to make that without crown because he has 30, uh, 360 degrees view. In cases where we have cemented crowns, uh, we need to find the place where actually the abutment is placed and only after that we can unscrew. And as I already mentioned, that often ends up in destroying the whole crown. For example, as you see with central incisor, there are possibly no way for us to put the restoration back in place. In such situations, we usually cut down the crown, make a temporary, and we wait time. Uh, we look for the reason why we had some problems. Often it's uh, the screw loosening, the abutment loosening, when the crown is moving forward and backward. Uh, and the only way often is just to destroy the crown and to make a new one. And that always is disappointing for us, for our patients, for our dental technician when he or she needs to do it once again. So for, today, for daily practice, we try to avoid this type of crowns. So the hygiene maintenance. Uh, on this slide, you see uh, a simple PMMA temporary bridge. Uh, actually, it was done instead of complete denture. It's fully completely dentureless patient. And you see how our patient uh, maintained the hygiene. It was in place only for three and a half months, so not that long. And if we make a cement retained reconstruction, uh, final cement retained reconstruction, we wouldn't be able to take it off and clean that, as we can easily do in such cases with multi units. Uh, and often our patients with uh, complete fixed partial dentures, uh, with screw tape complete, uh, we see them at least once a year. And once a year we unscrew them, we clean everything there, we look for in which places is it harder for our patients to clean, we uh, year by year teach them how they should maintain the hygiene. And for symmetric construction, it's really horror. We often see uh, simply how patients are not able to clean and we are not able to help them with that. So the next case I want to show you, uh, it's actually a patient that came for us with a problem. What do you see on the picture is the actual fit of crown to zirconia abutment. That was actually how it looked like intraorally. Uh, as you understand, uh, there was a lot of cement. Uh, it was everywhere. It was beneath the crown, it was beneath the abutment, it was all around in the soft tissues, everything was inflamed, and the main concern of patient was the pain that she felt and uh, the presence of fistula. And on this slide, uh, actually, you see uh, the presence of fistula. Uh, what did we did? Uh, we tried to take off the crown. Fortunately, uh, we could do that with uh, aid of some of our instruments. Uh, and actually, we unscrewed the abutment. The surgeon did a surgical intervention. He cleaned uh, the cement remnants. And after that, he simply filled it with uh, healing abutment. After the healing abutment, we made a new temporary crown, and as you see, right after debridement and screw retained temp crown on the implant, the fistula has been closed. So the only concern, the only issue with this uh, implant, the only issue why we had a huge inflammation, a huge discomfort for the patient, and the only reason this patient left uh, his restorative dentist was uh, the inability inability of doctor to clean out the cement uh, with the finish line one and a half millimeter below the gingival level. And we will see in the, uh, on the researchers why is it hard to do. 
So let's move on. Uh, the platform switching. Actually, the platform switching has been advocated as a method to reduce marginal bone loss by redirecting uh, the effect uh, of the EPLAT connection biofilm more vertically than horizontally. So uh, the biological width was formatted not uh, vertically but horizontally. So we've seen a lot of researches, for example, Lazara. Uh, where platform switching changed a lot. It was actually a paradigm shift 10 years ago, and for today, almost every type of conical implant has the platform switching options. A uh, concern of platform switching is the creation of additional horizontal undercut, which further complicates the cement removal. And we see on this slide uh, the courtesy of John Perry. Uh, we see how hard it is to remove cement from beneath this position of a crown. And the great, great book, The Cementation and Dental Implantology, actually shows that we often do not have the right access to remove the cement from this undercut. It's uh, not hard to do, it's impossible to do. Often, that's simply impossible to do. We must remember that, we must understand that, and it's okay if we can see the cement on an X-ray. But sometimes we use uh, the cements that are not enough radiopaque, and sometimes we, the cement remnants are on the buccal, lingual, or palatal sites where we just simply cannot see them on an X rays. Uh, as early as 1997, Agar and colleagues concluded uh, in an in vitro study that the process of removing excess cement from subgingival margins after cementation of restoration to the implant abutment can lead to the scratching of abutment. And actually, that's not the main concern. Uh, it also, uh, he, they also noticed that the cement removal uh, can be incomplete. And in fact, it's almost always incomplete. Uh, the, another investigation showed that the deeper the margin, the greater the amount of undetected cement with the greatest amount of cement found in the groups where the margins were placed two and three millimeters submucosally. Uh, that was often done because uh, some stock abutments, some systems don't have stock abutments with a uh, different gingival level. And as you, as far as you know, uh, for example, uh, the bio three or Orthodent, they have stock abutments with different shoulder levels, which makes it a lot easier to choose the correct abutment uh, independently of how deep the implant is placed and uh, how much of the soft tissues are there. And that's really, really, really important. So the recent, the recent investigation uh, found that about 81% of the implants restored with uh, cement-retained single crowns with clinically and radiological signs of perimplantitis had extracoronal residual cement presented. Therefore, this study concluded that residual cement uh, might act as one of the predisposing factors for the perimplantitis development. Implants with cement remnants in patients with history of periodontitis may be even more likely to develop uh, compared with implants in patients without the history of the, some periodontal disease. So, as you know, without me, uh, the periodontitis, uh, chronic periodontitis is a factor of risk in current implantology. And uh, that's topic number one in today's uh, conferences. So uh, in study reporting on the clinical and radiographic reexamination after nine years of almost 600 patients who had all received implant therapy, higher odds ratios, higher problems uh, were developing of periodontitis were identified for implants installed with crown restoration margins positioned more than one and a half, uh, I'm sorry, less than uh, one and a half millimeter uh, from the crestal bone at the baseline and more than two millimeters deeper than mucosal level. And actually we know that success rate of this prosthetics does not seem to be affected by the type of retention. That's the next thing we should also mention. Uh, the, the research of, of uh, 2017, uh, in this research, the authors uh, tried to see whether 
how hard is it to remove the cement, dependingly on the on how our uh, abutment looks like. Um, what did they did? Uh, they made models with a rigid gingiva mask. Uh, they made an abutments with convex and concave profiles. And actually, they asked the experienced clinicians to cement crown and the clean remnants. After that was performed, they took away the gingiva mask and uh, they were examining. What have they noticed? They have noticed that a lot more cement were left in the group with concave abutments. And uh, in that case, thing, two things that we need to consider. First, uh, there were no real patient, which uh, actually don't like when we try to scratch off the cement from beneath the abutments. So, doctor did, so the professionalists, so the doctors did that as long as they needed to. Uh, and the second thing, uh, the gingival mask is a lot more rigid than usually mucosa is. So I bet that in uh, clinical situations, in our everyday practice, the results will be even more dramatic. So residual subgingival cement seems to be strongly associated with perimplantite perimplant mucositis, which is a risk factor for increased probing depths, crystal bone loss, and perimplantitis. Zinc oxide eugenol cements should be preferred to resin cements, especially in the patients with a history of periodontitis. Uh, actually, we will talk a little more about cements a bit after. Uh, now we need to understand the mechanics of the screw retention, how that works. First of all, screws tighten up uh, from 50 to 75 percent of yield strength. Uh, that's the way how performing the clamping force. The torque applied, tensile force, also applied to the clamping force. And also the accurate fit of our components, of our uh, stock abutments, for example, of our uh, CATCAM abutments, uh, they do not stress the screw. And actually, if you want to know more about how that looks like, there are plenty of literature. For example, uh, the picture uh, I posted on the left uh, is very, very, very completely described in the article by Gebel in Gajar, the cement retained versus screw retained implant restorations achieving optimal occlusal and aesthetic in implant dentistry. Uh, it is really, really, really interesting, but uh, just in cases if you want to know the mechanics. Next thing, uh, the abutment requirements. Uh, they are very simple, pretty much the same as they were described in Schillenberg's prostodontics. Uh, first of all, the taper. Machined abutments always have exact six degrees taper. Uh, the more taper we have, the less retention we have. Uh, if we have a taper less than six degrees, for example, four or five degrees, we will have some cementation problems because the cement won't flow. The surface array, increasing in the surface array increases the retention. The longer the abutment is, the better the cement works. The same as in regular prostodontic cases. The surface finish line, the surface finish. Raw XL walls provide increased machined mechanical retention. Once again, the more uh, retention when we, for example, stand blast our abutments. And that is, once again, is pretty much the same as with natural teeth. That's the, actually the reason why cementable reconstruction became more popular in the 1980s. So the cement selecting. Uh, what I want to show you, first of all, is uh, the study. Uh, the prostodontic residency directors were in uh, 2008 were just asked uh, what cement usually they use uh, for conventional fixed restorations and for the implant restorations. And what do we see? That usually uh, the resin modified glass universe was used, sometimes even polycarboxylate. And here I want to stop uh, because the polycarboxylate is the worst way, for, as, as we know today, it is the worst way to uh, cement the implants. Why? Because the polycarboxylate cement uh, has a lot of fluor uh, in it um, as, as a part of it. And unfortunately, with today's uh, 
titanium surface, it can interact and cause corrosion. If we don't want corrosion, we shouldn't use the polycarboxylate cement. And uh, as you see, the thing is pretty, was pretty much the same in 2013. And about the zinc oxide ergonol, why is it better? First of all, it's semi-soluble. Even if the cement will run away, and even if it will be in the soft tissues, there is some uh, possibility that it will simply disappear from our soft tissues. The second thing, it doesn't cause the inflammation. And the main event why, uh, resin, for example, resin modified glass polymer is uh, not that good for cementing the grounds, is the ability of microbes to grow on the glass polymers. There was a study. There was a study in the literature when uh, they simply made discs with uh, set up cement and they uh, made the cultures over that. What did they notice? They noticed that there were actually no cultures, there were no microbes on zinc oxide, ergonol, cements. So they are antimicrobial. We know, we all know that. And as we see through the literature reviews, plenty, plenty literature reviews, uh, the implants with cemented reconstructions, cemented on zinc oxide ergonol, are usually uh, less expanded to Periimplantitis. So we see the periimplantitis not that often in cases where we use zinc oxide ergonol cement. So in our daily practice, uh, soy is one of the first one of the methods of cho for for choose for implant uh, restoration for cemented implant restorations. Uh, in this case, I want to show you how Bio3 BioLine uh, abutments can be used. Actually, the whole idea of BioLine is uh, the initial emergence profile, and they are pretty, every part of uh, BioLine, it is abutment, it is uh, healing, ab and healing abutment, and the conventional abutment. Uh, they have the same emergence profile from the very beginning to the end. And uh, the next important thing is that the gingival margin level is scalloped. It is scalloped uh, on the way it is usually presented intraorally. So it's a lot easier to remove cement in such cases. And actually, we've done a cemented metal ceramic crown on the uh, byline abutment. It was really straightforward case. Uh, and certainly, it's a lot easier to do than with conventional stock abutments, which are usually uh, hard how to create this uh, scallop gingival level from the all sides. Byline is a lot easier in these cases. So uh, what type of abutment modifications can we do to improve our retention, to improve our prognosis? First of all, air abrasion. As I've already mentioned, it increases, it increases the surface energy. The second part are the grooves on abutment. Uh, as you see, we've done on, the, on this premolar. The vertical grooves allow easier cement flow. So once again, uh, we need to understand that cements are non-Newtonian fluids. We'll talk about that more. And grooves ma make that a lot easier uh, for cement to flow away and not to contract, not to make stresses on the our on the our. Uh, occlusal part of our crown. The third thing, closing or leaving abutment screw hole open. Uh, actually, that reduces of, uh, the amount of cement excess. If we leave it a little more open, it makes uh, a little bit easier for us to cement the crown down. The internal venting. Sometimes we do small holes in the crown for the reason to change the flow of cement. It might be beneficial in cases if we will have bubble traps in the cement. Abutment finish line. Uh, actually, that's uh, the study of Linkevichus. By Thomas Linkevichus, uh, we have the link on it before. What uh, did they done? They done uh, plenty of abutments, and they asked the doctors to cement the cements. Uh, to cement the crowns over them, to clean the remnants uh, with gingival masks, and 
they just were looking through how that looks like. Uh, their conclusions were the deeper the margin, the harder to clean. Uh, if we have more than one and a half of two millimeters below gingiva, it's almost impossible to clean the whole cement. The second thing, the knife edge finish line is the most unpredictable, and it's some controversial in today's literature. On the other hand, we have BioPT, uh, where even on implant abutments we perform knife edge preparation, uh, knife edge preparation, and we can cement crown. And by uh, modifying the crown, we can modify the gingiva. Uh, I wouldn't recommend to use that unless you are pretty, uh, unless you are 100% uh, sure that you can clean all the cement. Especially, I will not recommend it to do if you have the marginal level below one and a half millimeter below the gingiva. And the third part, shoulder should follow the gingival line. If we have uh, the shoulder on the whole level, we will have a problems on the intraproximal area. Why? Because the intraproximal papillas, they usually uh, cover some parts of cement, and we don't have direct access. We often don't have the direct access. And that's uh, often is an issue for future periodontitis, periodontitis, I'm sorry. Uh, how to minimize the cement remnants? Uh, there are three, Widavi describes three possible ways uh, that are being used in all over the world how to cement the crowns. One type, one group of the dentists usually fill completely the crown as they do with uh, natural abutments, with teeth, uh, and after that they cement the crown. The second group uh, makes uh, uses a brush to applicate, and in such cases we see uh, the brush strokes, and the third group uh, of dentists usually perform only rim application. They uh, push the cement only on the shoulder level and hope that that will cover all the crown. Uh, to say truly, uh, we've done a lot like group three until we've noticed the Windavi research. Uh, they looked a lot, they made a lot of models, uh, they were just noticing how the cement flows. Uh, and actually, they've noticed that most predictable are the, is the brush application, because in the first group, uh, there is 99% reason we won't uh, push the crown to the end. It will, uh, just due to the plenty of cement in the occlusal region, the crown will not uh, be completely seated, unfortunately. In the third group, uh, there will there. Fortunately, there are 90% that we won't have uh, any micron of the cement in the occlusal region, which is actually uh, not good because it can cause uh, the cementation of the crown. And the second group are actually more predictable from these three groups. Uh, what they also mentioned, almost all cements in dentistry are non-Newtonian fluids. So they flow differently than water. They uh, do not fall away. And actually, that's, uh, that explains a lot why often we cannot see completely the crown. Independently, we, on the try-in, uh, we have seen that we have a perfect fit. The cement and occlusal part of crown resists completely sitting and causes stress. So uh, personal Bindavi suggestion is never uh, feel the occlusal uh, part of the crown with cement. Usually the best way to apply that with a brush on the middle part of the crown. The more force we apply to crown during the seating, the more chance to damage surrounding soft tissues. Uh, there is a high possibility if we hurry up when we're cementing, simply to damage the tissues. And actually that 99% will cause the perimplantitis. Uh, also, they've noticed that slower the seating, the more homogeneously cement flows. So from all of this, what we need to know, what, what we need to understand, uh, actually we need only 3% of the surface, only 3% uh, of the cement than we usually use. We need to uh, brush it very easily. We do not need to have a lot of cement. We need to place slowly. We need uh, not to push the crown, the crown while sitting too much because every 
think every part of uh, the thing we will do uh, wrong will cause, actually can cause the preimplantitis. It can cause uh, the cement remnants beneath our abutment and in five to nine years, according to the literature, there's a high possibility we will have very implantitis. So there are a few techniques that are actually making it a lot easier to remove the cement. The first of all is the rubber dam technique. It can be used on a segment, on a one tooth, or some dentists that say no, uh, touch the clamp on the neighboring tooth, and they're actually making the complete isolation. In such cases, it's uh, better to use the heavier rubber dam because it can uh, compress the gingiva. And uh, with the rubber dam on, we can visually better see the cement. And there is slightly bigger possibility for the cement not to flow beneath the rubber dam. Unfortunately, it flows beneath, but not in that quantity as without uh, the rubber dam. Once again, there was a study when, uh, usually how we do that 10 years ago, we just took a cord, placed that intracirculary in near the implant, cemented, and just took off the cord. Unfortunately, often this cord does nothing. Once again, according to literature, according to big researchers, uh, the method with rubber dam makes it a little more predictable. But personally for me, uh, the method of choose is the silicone dye technique. Uh, what do we do? First of all, uh, we took the crown, we take the crown uh, before cementing, and we make some kind of spacer, like dental technicians, they uh, place the spacer over the dye. We just use PTFE, teflon. Uh, we insert that inside the crown, adapt that, and actually it, uh, it works as a small spacer for us. It usually gives us nearly 50 microns of space for cement to flow. Uh, for contemporary cements, we need at least 25 microns uh, for cement to be homogeneously uh, all around the preparation. So after that, we use a kind of byte registration material that FAST sets. In these cases, that was uh, blue mousse. Usually we use futar for that. That's, uh, the main idea is to use very rigid material. And we have kind of cupping of uh, our abutment. After that, we place abutment intraorally. We completely screw it. And we can, uh, and we first with cement, we put the, we pull the, we fill the crown with cement. After that, we, uh, cement our crown on a silicon die. So all the cement remnants flow away. And after that, only after that, we uh, seat the crown on an abutment. In such cases, we usually have nearly zero cement remnants all around the crown. So for today, it's the most predictable way. And I know plenty of dentists using that day by day. Uh, it was practice changing for me, and I'm happy I have an ability to uh, share that with you. So take home message. First of all, the proper treatment planning is mandatory. As already mentioned, the uh, implant position should be prosthetically driven. In such cases, uh, we can place, uh, we can make scrutiny crowns and make our lives and lives of our patients less stressful. The second part, the success rate of these prosthetics does not seem to be affected by the type of restoration. Uh, the main problem uh, with, once again, the main problem with contemporary implants is the perimplantitis. Uh, the main cause of perimplantitis, unfortunately, is cement, but not the type of prosthetics, whether it is single crown or fixed partial denture or veneer on an individual abutment, that doesn't matter. Uh, the third, both retention types have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, same as for the screw retained and same for the cement retained. Um, cement retained reconstructions suggested uh, where easier control of occlusion is needed. Uh, in the patients with heart occlusal disease, when we need to be very, very, very precise 
uh, we sometimes use this cement retained reconstruction, especially since we developed the silicon dye technique for us. Once again, it, it becomes more and more predictable. Fifth, the major problem of cement retained prosthetics is cement control. We've talked about that really a lot. There are some techniques, but still, uh, literature says that we are, the cement retained reconstructions are in group of risk. And last, retained prosthetics showed higher incidence of chipping. We should be ready for that just because we don't have enough support for the ceramic in such cases. But uh, for a lot of our patients, it's, uh, it's okay to have risk of chipping instead of ground removing in case of abutment loosening, which sometimes unfortunately happens. Uh, also, with Neben showed a very, very, very simple scheme uh, on how to go, whether we should screw cement or screw or cement retain our crowns. First of all, we need to choose, do, uh, is this teeth anterior or posterior? If it is uh, anterior, is it bone level implant or tissue level implant? 99% of implants in our today practice are bone level. Uh, with bone level implants, we always can do a screw retain provisional it's really easy to mask uh, the screw tension hole with composite. And if uh, the implant prosthetic uh, in ideal position, we easily can use screw retained. If the implant prosthetic is malpositioned, we need to use uh, the cementable reconstruction. But the only thing we should consider, the crown manager is not to be too deep. In case of posterior implants, if we have inadequate interclusal space, less than four millimeters, uh, no, not less than, for at least four millimeters, we should use uh, the screw retained reconstruction. Uh, the cement retained will unfortunately the cement. If we see the posterior reconstructions uh, and the implant is ideal position, 100% it is screw retained prosthetics. In case of uh, intact occlusal surface desired uh, for narrower, crowns or due to the, some occlusal events uh, or implant is small position, we can and we should use uh, the cement retained crowns. Actually, keep calm and use science. It will make a lot easier your practice. Uh, thank you a lot for your attention. We uh, now will make uh, a pause. Okay, we will make a little pause for one minute to check out questions and we will be back in a minute. So we are back and let's uh, talk about the questions you've left. First question about how the conical connection uh, affecting the occlusion. Uh, not the conical connection by itself, but uh, the thing that we, dental technicians never, uh, when they're manufacturing the crowns, they are never screwing uh, it with the torque uh, that we need on the final restoration due to the uh, screw can be damaged well, this will be repeated a few times. So uh, they do crowns uh, in some kind of, my dental technicians, I ask them to make them a little uh, hyper occlusionally. So make them a little bit in a super occlusion. Uh, so when we push the torque range to 35 newtons, and with conical connection, we don't have uh, that stop point like with uh, external connection, for example, or uh, hexagon connection. And uh, when we're screwing the implant down, uh, the crown actually goes lower and lower and lower and lower. And sometimes uh, we've met with this problem, I guess 10 years ago last time, uh, when we screwed the crown down and we've noticed that uh, the crown is actually not in the occlusion. Uh, and we were disappointed because we had uh, the glute in the T-base crown. We just needed to, to redo that. Uh, next question. Uh, yes, I, I, was, I was saying that more titanium screw actually may, cause, may, may affect occlusion. It, it will cause not the occlusion, it will, it will affect the occlusal plane of our prosthesis. Uh, the next question is about uh, the zinc oxide, is about the cements. 
is it strong enough to last for a long time? Uh, as we as the abutments that we use are uh, very 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 retentive, they have six degrees, they have par almost parallel walls, they are long enough, and we can modify them. Uh, usually, zinc oxide eugenol is enough. Uh, in any way, uh, I would rather have. Uh, the crown decemented, the micron or crown of my patient decemented, uh, instead of uh, seeing uh, the preimplantitis, instead of seeing some microbes on the cement. Uh, according to literature, it's uh, recommended to use zinc oxide eugenol over resin modified glass ionomer, just due to the reason, just, just due to the purpose uh, not to have more microbes in our, on our transmucosal uh, profile. And uh, actually, according to those researches, uh, the zinc oxide organol, uh, whether it is uh, extempore or uh, it is uh, being manufactured, they all work good enough. Uh, can I repeat? Can you repeat about the abutment modifications? Yes, uh, I have opened uh, the slide with the implant modification, and actually there are uh, four points that uh, I mentioned. First of all, air abrasion, it increases the surface energy, uh, then groove on the abutment, uh, it actually allows easier cement flow. The closing or leaving uh, the screw hole open depending of uh, how big the taper is. Uh, for example, Sometimes we are doing cement retained fixed partial dentures on the implants, and the placement of implant uh, tells us to do uh, a little bigger taper. In such cases, I uh, fill the screw hole uh, to the maximum level for the cement uh, to cover more and more my abutment. In case of single crowns, almost uh, never I. Uh, leave the hole completely closed. It's a little bit open just to compensate the forces when I am uh, sitting the crown down. Uh, and actually the internal venting, uh, it's when once again, when we have single crowns and uh, where the one taper of abutment is high and we think that our cement uh, might uh, completely flow out Sometimes uh, the internal venting helps, but usually we don't do them. Uh, it's enough uh, to leave the screw hole a little bit, not completely, but a little bit opened. Next question, the rubber dam technique. Uh, the best and easy? Uh, for me not, because I've noticed, uh, I've seen that some cement still, uh, personally I've done few uh, screw cemented crowns just to check myself. How easily can I remove the cement? And I noticed that using the rubber dam, even very, very heavy Nikton rubber dam, unfortunately, uh, the cement flows beneath the rubber dam. Uh, and that was very pity, but since uh, we usually use uh, the silicone dye technique, it's, it's become a lot, a lot, a lot easier for us. So I guess we've answered all the questions. Anyway, uh, I will once again I will show the last slide. Uh, here are my contact email, my Facebook account. Anytime, any day, if you have any questions uh, on this topic or any other, I, if I can help you, I would be happy to answer you. So once again, thank you a lot for attention uh, and have a nice day.